So I would like to talk about um, vibrations. And I'm an artist. I, I'm a painter. Nobody believes that because of the work I do. I work with scientists, and I'm very interested in the inaudible and the invisible realm. Um, and just to give you a little background, um, what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes is this butterfly, which is the symbol of the collective metamorphosis that we are going through together. And this is true of the art world, too, witnessing the talks today. So by way of background, I was very interested in work of Buckminster Fuller, particularly his ideas of patterns in nature and his philosophy. So I started uh, spending a lot of time in the Buckminster Fuller archives in Santa Barbara, looking through his papers and finding out some really interesting things about anticipatory design science, the idea of artists, scientists, creatives anticipating what's coming. In anticipation, um, we come to the buckyball. This is something that was discovered by Smalley and Croto, who found this new molecule, a third carbon molecule. And the instruments were not strong enough at that point for them to really detect it, to see what what is in there. Um, so Smalley or Crodo, I'm not sure who, actually was very inspired by the dome, this dome that was uh, designed in, in 1967, if you know about it. Now if you see how this buckyball looks, it's like a football, it's like a cage. And it's an icon of nature, it's an icon of nanotechnology, it's an icon of a new age that's coming. This was anticipated by Buckminster Fuller, which is in a way symbolized by the fact that it was actually named after him. Very inspiring to me. So we jump to 2001 when I meet uh, James Jemjewski, who came to UCLA from IBM Zurich, where he actually studies buckyballs. And in our discussions, I find out that he never heard of Buckminster Fuller. So this is the value of scientists working with artists. We bring in larger knowledge. We bring in a bigger picture. But again, there's also value of me working with scientists as well. And this is a proud moment where he's actually showing me on his scanning tunneling microscope how atomic force works. So I consider that a graffiti on a million dollar machine. <laughs> Here's a short explanation of why this is so fascinating to me, philosophically, not scientifically so much. If you look at this finger, this is an explanation that Jim gave me. If you look at this finger and imagine it as an Eiffel Tower, and you see these dots as golf balls, this Eiffel Tower is moving through this, the texture of the, the molecule and then registering it, and then we see it as a visual. But that's really impossible for us to imagine, actually. How could you possibly imagine that in that, in that scale? This is a tip of the scanning tunneling microscope, and at the tip is an atomic size um, point. So to me, 20th century technology is this. This is actually how you could understand scanning tunneling microscope. It's going on the groove of a molecule and producing pictures, right? So we advance to the 20th, through the 20th century and then get to this point where we start working with molecules. I, I started working with him closely in the lab and we actually managed to move some molecules together and really thinking about what this means uh, and how to explain this in terms of scale, but also what it means for us. Here's how the buckyballs actually look from the scanning tunneling microscope. All of this is my kind of 
looking through and researching to what's going on. And here's a first project that we did together. It's called Zero Wave. What I wanted to do is actually take these buckyballs and make them huge rather than think of something that's really inaccessible to us. And he's manipulating the buckyballs with his shadow. So the idea was to show how we at a distance are making change happen. That's another picture. Another proud moment coming up. Uh, I brought Tibetan monks to Jim's lab as well, and we started working closely with them. What we discovered with Tibetan monks, well, in this moment, they actually said, you do all this to create empty space? <laughs> they felt kind of sad for the scientists. Um, <laughs> so, but they actually thought it was very interesting, and they related to nanotechnology instantly. There was no learning curve. Um, when he explained about the tip that I showed you, he said, oh yes, we meditate on a million Buddhas on top of a pin. Same thing. <laughs> and here's the monk actually working under the microscope. That's a whole other story. Okay, so this moves me to vibrations. Here's, this is a yeast cell. What Jim and his team decided to do is actually use the scanning tunneling microscope and his instruments to, go, to measure vibrations of live cells. Here's what came back to them. So when he looked at this, he was very excited because he saw how the vibration of the cell actually has energy going up and down. But he thought, if I send this to her, she's not going to appreciate it. He was right, I wasn't. I would probably say, yeah, great, I'm happy for you. Um, but there were people in his lab who worked with media, who were also musicians, and so he said, it's data. Why don't you, she's a media artist, why don't you just transfer it to sound? Data is data, it doesn't have to be transferred to visual, especially invisible data. So he sent me an IAM file, which was really exciting. I couldn't believe I was listening to live cells. And a piece emerged out of it. Uh, we started thinking more and more about it. And it actually, produced a paper for his group because a whole new type of science and scientific data investigation started around this. It hit into popular culture and uh, because he's Scottish, he threw some scotch into the cells and they were screaming. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, it definitely got into the popular culture as well. Um, and this brings me to the butterfly. So in that kind of real interest in this new idea of uh, sounds and cells and uh, people from all aspects of life interested, a woman calls and asks him if he ever Im measured the chrysalis turning into a butterfly. He said, no. Uh, pretty soon from Stringer's lab, he got a bunch of chrysalises and he started kind of occasionally looking into it. He was, really wasn't that interested. I wasn't either. So the thing is that both of us actually were not interested, but it, it was kind of in front of us. So in between times, he would look, I would look, occasionally we would talk about it. What's really fascinating actually is that this wing, this iridescent blue, has no pigment. So that's actually nano-optics. What you're seeing is texture and pattern in those wings. That was great. So he went and imaged this at the FIE lab, and that was fantastic. Beautiful images, but I didn't really know what to do with it. Um, more beautiful images. These are all cells, and it's all actually empty space. So it's kind of mind-blowing working with this stuff more images, um, and it was very difficult to do what she asked to measure the vibration of chrysalis turning into a butterfly because the instruments just couldn't handle it. This is an MRI of the chrysalis. 
where we discovered there's hearts inside the chrysalis that are constantly pumping, which was very interesting. But again, what do you do with this? Finally, what they managed to do is by throwing a laser, uh, having a mirror on the chrysalis and throwing a laser on it, they were able to measure the vibrations of the metamorphosis for about two weeks. And here's the images of this metamorphosis. This is when it became really, really interesting to both of us. Because look at how change happens. Change does not happen gradually like we would want it to or like we're taught. You do this and then this and then this and then something happens. Not at all. It happens suddenly. There's either a birth or a death or an accident or you win the lottery. When, when change happens, it's sudden. And what's amazing is that this change was happening in these bursts and the sound was incredible. Uh, so it shifted to something very important to us. It became a metaphor for what we're going through. Uh, collectively, not just uh, us looking at this, but as a metaphor of what's going on in the world today, the drastic changes we're going through. And I would like you to hear it just for a moment because talking about it doesn't really do it justice. So if you could just pump up the sound, we we'll do this for one minute and then we'll let it go. Now, when you see the burst, that burst is that light, it's actually the burst of the sound. Uh, and if you hear the sound, it would be something that we could possibly interpret as pain. So those are images that I showed you earlier, but now they're uh, moving with sound. This brings me to a very quick um, intro into where we first did this piece. It was not in a museum. It was not in a gallery. It was in uh, the desert, in Joshua Tree. Uh, this rock is uh, in Landers, in California, where this man, Kritzer, lived under it. He created an apartment, and he talked to UFOs there. And this is the place of the largest UFO conventions ever. So what you're seeing here is in the 60s, 50s, um, these conventions of UFOs were coming together to meet and discuss and talk about um, this vision that came to be a little after. So what you're seeing here is the Integratron that's in Landers, California. And it was inspired by Tesla and apparently given to the creator as um, vision from the UFOs, from, uh, from the space. We decided this is a perfect place for the blue morph. And I just want to end by showing you how the audience becomes the performer and how this piece that emerged out of the sounds and colors of the butterfly actually made people get into a ritual on their own, very much self-organized. And the kind of um, responses we got is pretty amazing. Nobody really cared who's the artist or the scientist. The audience took it and became part of it and became the center of it. So each person would come onto this seat and put on this mad hat with a 50-foot meteorological balloon and feel the vibrations of change. And here it is in Gdansk in Poland in the cathedral where the verticality is absolutely amazing and the one person can just light up the entire church with these sounds of metamorphosis. Um, a young butterfly. Uh, this is in Governor's Island. Here it was all summer in Governor's Island in the Cornelius Chapel. 
And here you can see how the audience becomes part of this kind of group ritual, and everybody brings their own idea to how they feel about it. So for some reason, it ended up in quite a few churches. Just want to show you different iterations of it. This is in Florence and in Denmark. Uh, the piece itself also takes on different variations depending on the architecture. So how do you value this? How do you value it in the art world? And how do we bring in ritual and performance and science, art and science, into something that's third? That's not art or science, but really a kind of a shift in our own values of what our society is about. I don't know. I just think that a lot of the art world today is still in the old paradigm. And what needs to happen is starting to happen, even here with the bio lab that Susanna and Chris started here. It's fantastic. So thank you.